Hey, 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 it's Pastor Mike. If you love what we do at Time of Grace, speaking biblical truth into everyday issues, then you are going to love the podcast, The Non-Microwave Truth, by my friend and brother in Jesus, C.L. Whiteside. C.L. is a high school educator and a coach who isn't afraid to take on tough topics, but always through the lens of God's Word. Just search for The Non-Microwave Truth wherever you get your favorite podcasts. How old are you? I'm 40. You have about a year and a half. This was a conversation between the well-known preacher John Piper and his mentor Jim Conway. Jim Conway was trying to tell him that over these next few months and this next year to not be surprised if he would go through a type of midlife crisis or burnout. And he was right. John Piper went through a season around 40 years old where nothing was working anymore. He was depressed. He lost his ambition and he burned out. There was a study done by Cornell University that talked about this, that that many people experience a type of burnout or a type of midlife crisis about age 40. I know in my life, when I turned about 40, something happened to me where I just felt like I was going through a fog. I felt depressed. I didn't have the goals or ambitions that I had before. I mean, that's where you're at right now. The things that were working before are no longer working. Uh, you don't have the same kind of hope or purpose in the future like you had before. And you're wondering, what is happening to me? Why do I, why am I burning out? Why am I going through this midlife crisis? Well, there's a few different reasons you're probably experiencing this. Number one, uh, it's physical. Uh, some of this are the physical limitations that you're experiencing. You think about an all-star athlete that finally reaches their prime and and has to hang it up. I mean, even Tom Brady had to retire at some time. And so some of the things that we used to be able to do, we can't do anymore. And so there's this physical limitation. There's also a mental limitation that we might be experiencing. Arthur Brooks, in his book, Strength to Strength, talks about the different difference between fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence is this ability to have new ideas and be creative. And he says that scientifically, this type of fluid intelligence seems to peak in our 20s and 30s. And then as we enter into our 40s, it starts to wane. And so you think about some of the most creative people in history, the the Beatles or Albert Einstein or Steven Spielberg, when you look back on their life, they probably, they, all of them had their great ba- breakthrough, their big breakthrough in their 20s and 30s. And so that's the reality for us too. We might be trying to hold on to this fluid intelligence when really we should be thinking more about our crystallized intelligence. And this is a, the crystallized intelligence is this ability to make connections with past information, um, to to be able to connect with lots of different information and build on our past. Really, this is about wisdom. And the good news about crystallized intelligence is this will go on uh, and we'll be able to hold on to this and really grow in crystallized intelligence way uh, into our later on in life. And so if you're trying to hold on to who you were when you were younger, that ability to have all the new ideas and be the most creative person at the table, you're probably holding on to something uh, that you, need to, you don't need to hold on to anymore. And then finally, one of the reasons why we might be going through a season of burnout or midlife crisis is because we're having some existential or spiritual struggles. King Solomon talked about this in his book, uh, Ecclesiastes, where he said, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. It's a chasing after the wind. He looked back on his life and all of his accomplishments, um, all the things that he was able to do, he couldn't hold on to them anymore. And he came to realize that no matter how much he accomplished, no matter how much he did, soon it would be forgotten and he would have to face the reality of his death. And so these are some of the reasons why you might be facing burnout right now or a midlife crisis. And the big point in this first video is you're not weird, that this is a normal process. And so when you start to feel maybe a little lack of ambition or you might feel uh, kind of disoriented and not knowing what your purpose is for your second half of life, 
Don't follow the cliche uh, kind of pattern of dropping your spouse and buying the sports car or making this big decision that could really ruin your life. Take a moment to stop, to breathe, and create some room for God to work in your life. Now, in the next few videos, I'm going to talk about different strategies and things you can do as you walk through and move through your midlife and maybe a season of burnout or crisis. But right now, all I want you to do is to stop, breathe, create some room for God, recognize that God is with you. He's going to carry you into this next season, and you're not weird. Why don't we close the prayer? Let's pray. Lord God, we know that you have carried us to this point in our lives and we might feel a little bit disoriented. We might not know what our purpose is, but we trust that you're going to carry us into the next season of life. I recently rewatched the movie Inside Out. I don't know if you've seen the movie. Uh, it tells the story of a young girl named Riley who has moved from Minnesota to California and all the different emotions that she's feeling. What makes this movie interesting is they tell the story from inside Riley's head, from the perspective of her emotions. And the emotion Joy is the main character, and Joy explains what the role is of all the different emotions. She says that fear's job is to protect Riley from doing things that could hurt her, and disgust's job is to keep her from eating anything poisonous, and anger's job is to let Riley know if there's been an injustice, and Joy's job is to make sure everything is fun and enjoyable. And then Joy looks at the emotion sadness, and she says, I'm not really sure what sadness job is. And maybe that's how you feel. You know, sadness can be a very hard emotion to feel and process. And sometimes we don't realize what is the point of sadness? Why do we have this ability to be sad? Well, if you're going through a season of burnout or a midlife crisis, chances are one of the reasons that you're experiencing this burnout is it's time for you to grieve some of your losses. You might have to grieve the loss of the life that will never be. When you reach a certain uh, part in your or age in your life, your options start to become more limited. When you were younger, it seems like you could do anything. You had all the time in the world to maybe start a family or try a new career or try a new skill. But as we grow older, because of some of the decisions that we've made, some of those options become more limited. And so we might be grieving a life that we thought we were going to have, but is no longer possible. Another thing that we might be grieving is uh, some challenging relationships. Whenever I talk to people who are going through burnout, we talk about some of the losses and the relationships that they've had and the challenging relationships they have. And I tell them to make a list of all the people who have hurt them, the people that they're still angry with. And usually the list comes to about three to five people. It seems like all of us have about three to five people that have hurt us. And we might be holding on to that anger instead of grieving the loss of those relationships and the pain that we felt. And then for some of us, we need to grieve the loss of, of losing people, that there might be been a parent or family member or friend that's no longer here, that they've, they've died. And so uh, we need to really grieve those losses, especially as we go through a season of, of midlife crisis and burnout. Now, the good news is, is that God gives us the words to grieve. He teaches us how to experience sadness and why sadness is so important. It's in the Psalms where we read Psalm 6 as this, I am worn out from all my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. And so the Psalms gives us permission to weep and to wail and to cry out to God as we mourn all the losses in our life. Psalm 13 says something similar. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? 
How long must I wrestle with my thoughts day after day, have sorrow in my heart? And so this longing, God, how long are you going to let me endure this pain and suffering? How long do I have to go through this time of confusion? And, and maybe those words really resonate with you, especially in a season of burnout and midlife crisis. And then Psalm 42 says this, My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One. So maybe you're mourning this idea that you, you felt like one, at one time you had this strong faith in God. You were walking with God, but now God seems so far away because there's been so many losses and so much grief in your life and you don't know where he is. And this is important. It's important for us to go through that process of mourning our losses, the loss of people, the losses of, of the life that we wanted, uh, the losses of close relationships. And the good news is Jesus gives us encouragement to grieve. He says in the New Testament, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And so as you take a moment to recognize that you're going through this season of burnout, this midlife crisis, take a moment to grieve your losses. Write down those things that, that are on your heart and then give them to God. Take a moment to create some space to let God help you process all these losses so that you can move on with the next half of your life. Let's pray. Lord God, in this world of sin, we are going to experience loss. And so, Lord God, our hearts are heavy, and we, we pray that you would help us move through this loss, that you would lead us to accept some of the things that we've lost, accept the life that we will not live, or the people we won't see, at least for right now. We pray, Lord God, that you would give us a sense of peace and a hope uh, that you still have good plans for us, and ultimately the plan of the resurrection. In your name we pray. You're not tired, you're empty. This is what a therapist said to Pastor Craig Groeschel. He's a pastor who leads a very large church and he was feeling drained and he was feeling burnt out and depressed. And he went on a vacation, an extended vacation, but when he came back, he felt just as empty and just as sad and depressed and he didn't know what to do. And that's when his therapist told him, you're not tired, you're empty. The work that you're doing is, is draining you like a battery being drained of its energy, like a car that's running out of fuel, and he needed to find a way to fill up. If you're going through a season of burnout or midlife crisis, this might be what's going on in your life. It's not that you're just tired. Because if you're tired, you could just go sleep more or take a vacation and you would feel better. But if it feels like nothing you do gives you enough rest, well, maybe it's not that you're tired, but maybe you're, maybe you need to be filled up. You're empty. This seems to be what was going on uh, for King Solomon when he wrote this in, in his book, Ecclesiastes. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to a person who has not toiled for it. This, too, is meaningless, a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This, too, is meaningless." So Solomon was looking at all the hard work that he was doing and he felt empty. He felt like it was all meaningless. He felt drained because he was working so hard and he didn't see a purpose in it. That's how you feel. Solomon goes on to explain ways that we can respond to that feeling of being empty. He says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, a person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, 
Who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. And so Solomon says, if you're feeling empty, engage in some of the simple joys of life to fill you up. You know, eating a good meal, enjoying time with, in nature or family and friends, enjoying the simple things of life. I know when I was going through a season of burnout and uh, feeling like a, a midlife crisis, what I needed to do was engage with nature. So I did a short camping trip, just me and my dog. We got in, out into nature, reconnected with God, went on a few hikes. I came back filled up. So what about you? If you're feeling empty right now, what are some activities that are maybe different from the work that you do, different from the things that are draining you to fill you up? Is it connecting with nature? Is it connecting with family or friends? What are some of those activities that could fill you up when you're feeling empty? Give yourself some space, some room to reconnect with God, his word, and things that fill you up. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of work, but sometimes work can feel like meaningless toil. So if we're feeling empty right now, show us the things that would fill us up. Help us to be filled up on you and your presence so that we can return to the activities and callings that you have given us and serve to your glory. In your name we pray. I can't do what I used to be able to do. I used to be able to play basketball for hours, but if I would do that now, uh, my knee would hurt for weeks. I used to be able to lift weights and do all sorts of other athletic competitions, and I just can't do that anymore. Most of us recognize that as we age, we become more limited in our physical capacity. What we don't always want to recognize is that what's going on in our bodies is also going on in our brains. As I mentioned in the first video, uh, the work of Arthur Brooks, who says that we have two different types of intelligence. We have fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence has to do with that ability to solve complex problems and to uh, come up with new creative ideas. And that type of intelligence seems to peak uh, in our 30s and, and then starts to dwindle in our 40s. And that's why many of your favorite inventors or musicians or artists or leaders had their great big breakthrough in their 30s or 20s. But the good news is we have another type of intelligence. We have crystallized intelligence. This is that capacity for wisdom. And this type of intelligence, it, it really takes ideas from our life and from all our different circumstances, and it's able to apply them to new situations. For example, this is like a librarian who's able to scan through all the different books in the library and grab just the right book for each person. And that's what we have. And that type of intelligence continues to grow well into our 70s and beyond. And I think this is what Solomon is talking about when he writes about this, uh, the, the gifts that we have to give later on in years uh, in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 29 says this, The glory of young men is their strength. Gray hair, the splendor of the old. And so when you're younger, the gift you have to give to the world is your strength and vitality. But as you age, you have something else to give. You might not be able to be as, as strong or might be able to not be able to do all the thing, same things physically or mentally, but you have wisdom. You have experiences, both your successes and your failures, to be able to pass on wisdom to that next generation. And so if you're going through a midlife crisis or maybe a season of burnout, it might be because you're holding on to those good old days, those days when, when you were different, when you were younger and you had different capacities. And so now it's time to change your mindset. Instead of seeing yourself as the player, now look at yourself as the coach. Instead of seeing yourself as the student, think of yourself as the teacher. Instead of seeing yourself as the apprentice, 
See yourself as the state, the sage. Instead of seeing yourself as the hero at the center of the story, think of yourself as the guide on the side. Now, when you change your mindset like this, you're not accepting a downgrade in your life or in your uh, contribution. This is a very important purpose. You're passing on wisdom to the next generation who wants to serve their Savior. And so, as you recognize that your body is changing, your brain is changing, that you don't have the same capacities that you used to have, it's time to change your mindset as you enter into midlife. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for all the gifts and abilities and capacities that we had in our younger years. And now, Lord God, as we enter into the second half of our life, we pray that you allow us to be uh, mentors and teachers to pass on wisdom to the next generation who wants to serve you. In your name we pray, amen. Nobody asks for burnout. Nobody wants to be going through a midlife crisis. But if you're watching these videos, this might be where you're at today. And if you're feeling that way, you, you probably feel a sense of hopelessness. Maybe you have this idea that your best days are behind you, that you wonder if God's done with you, that he's got nothing in store for you because of all the ways that maybe you screwed things up in the past or, or maybe made some bad decisions. If that's how you feel, if you feel that God's done with you, I want you to consider the story of Moses. Do you know this story? Moses grew up in Egypt. It just so happened that he found himself in the palace of the Egyptians, the most powerful nation in the world where he got the best education in the world. But then when he turned 40, he saw one of his own countrymen, another Hebrew, being beaten up by an Egyptian. And in a moment of vengeance and, and anger, he killed that Egyptian. And his murder went public. Everybody knew about it, and he had to run into exile. Now, Moses then spent the next 40 years off in the wilderness taking care of sheep. Now, if you were able to talk to Moses at that point of his life, what do you think he was thinking? Maybe he was thinking, God's done with me. I had all the opportunity, all the potential when I was in Egypt, and I screwed it all up because of my moment of vengeance. Now I've been just out here in the wilderness watching over sheep. I'm going to be in exile the rest of my life. My life is over. God's done with me. But it was at that moment when Moses turned 80 years old, where he was out tending his sheep in the middle of the wilderness, where he saw a bush on Mount Sinai that was on fire but wasn't burning up. He went closer to investigate and he found out that God wanted to speak to him through this bush. And God said that he was calling Moses to go back to Egypt and lead the nation of Israel out of Egyptian slavery. He couldn't believe it. In fact, he looked around and thought, Lord, you must be mistaken. I've, I've screwed up too much. I've, I've had too many mistakes. I've, I haven't been in Egypt in 40 years. I'm an old man now. You must be done with me. But God wasn't going to stop his plan. God was committed to Moses, that he was going to use all of his past experiences for Moses' next chapter in his life. He was going to use his first 40 years being raised in Egypt so that Moses was able to speak to those Egyptian leaders and understand the culture as he was going to lead the people out of Egypt. He was going to use his experience of the last 40 years watching over sheep in the wilderness because Moses was going to lead the Israelites through that very same wilderness into the promised land. And God has something in store for you as well. I believe that, that God is going to use your past experiences, the, the failures and the successes in the next chapter of your life. I believe that your best days are yet to come. In the scriptures, it says that God knows the plans that he has for us. 
plans to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us hope and a future. And that's the same for you. In fact, this video might be your burning bush moment. Maybe God is going to use these words to remind you of your calling, to call you into action, to remind you that he's got wonderful things for you to do in this second half of life. And so, my dear brother and sister in Christ, if you're going through this moment of midlife crisis, if you're going through this challenge, I want you to remember that God's not done with you yet. Your best days are yet to come. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray for all those people who are struggling right now. They're hitting this wall of burnout, this midlife crisis. I pray that you would speak to them like you did to Moses, that you would encourage them to take up their calling, to serve you, to use all of their past successes and failures in this next chapter of their life. We'll only be able to do this because of the power of your spirit and because of your grace. In your name we pray. 